you know, as you get older, you start to reflect on that, and and you go to funerals and so forth, and you start thinking about your own mortality and oh gee, what would yeah, you know, what would I like? What what would be my preferences? And then and then you reflect on it, and oh, it, oh yeah, that would be nice, you know, like it's just something personal, and it would be a connection for my family. I have thought about it, but not very much. The way I see it, or or when we when I talk with my peers, if, if it comes up at all, then it's either burial or cremation. My name is Peter Bergs, and um, I turned 70 this year. It, it started to make me think, uh, yeah, but... It, and I don't think it is, it, it is, there are easy answers to it. And it, they're not black and white issues. According to a recent survey by McCrindle on attitudes to funerals in Australia, 60% of Australians would choose cremation as their preferred method to dispose of their body. 20% would choose burial and 14% have no preference. But are Australians limited to just these options anymore? In the last few decades, attitudes have slowly been changing around after-death care. With growing interest in low environmental impact and non-religious options, the industry has been changing, with many new options now becoming available. So, if you don't want to end up somewhere like this, what are your options? One of your options is aquamation, or alkaline hydrolysis. Here's John Humphreys from Aquamation Industries. Essentially, instead of the body going into an incinerator, it goes into water and it breaks down in a totally natural way. So, yeah, so the body goes into a, a stainless steel container and what is left is basically the bones, which we give back to the family, the same as cremation. Uh, we still call them ashes. Um, people sometimes say, well, how can there be ashes if there's no fire? We say, well, when you do a cremation, it's done like, it's like a jet blast out of a, a jet engine. And so it doesn't leave a lot of ash. So when you get a thousand degree blast of propane, get, uh, gas, um, everything gets burnt except the bones. So what you get back from a cremation, which are actually called ashes, are in fact bones. Our process also doesn't destroy the bones. So we also return the bones. So, so at the end of it, you have the bones left over. You have also the alkaline solution. What happens with that? Um, okay, well, in various areas, different things can happen. It could be put into the sewage system, which means it then eventually goes out to the ocean. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing we're doing at the moment, though, is we're actually using it as a fertiliser. In, for, on a, in forests, so we're putting into some for, some tree plantations, and it gets used as a fertilizer. If if a person got lost out in the bush, then their body would break down um, with this process. Essentially, it, the difference would be if if it happened in on the equator, it'd probably take a few days. If it happened in North Australia, it'd probably take couple more days and if it happened in Tasmania it might take weeks mm -hmm. sort of thing depending on the environment but the actual process is a, a natural process it's just that we put it into equipment and we maximize the environment so that it makes it happen reasonably quickly by reasonably quickly I mean about 10 hours. Another emerging option that is becoming increasingly popular is natural burials where a body is buried without embalming a traditional coffin or sometimes even a tombstone. Natural bush burials may appeal to many people, but there's not many places in Australia where it's possible. This cemetery in Lismore is one of very few in Australia where natural bush burials are available. Um, so I'm Kevin Trustum and I'm the Commercial Services Business Manager. The Bushland Cemetery is probably around um, about five, six years old. Um, and we started it just due to the fact that space at our site was, was running out. Um, we've just recently bought some more land, but besides that, the, the land here was available in, within the trees, within the bushland area. Um, so we wanted to look at the best way of utilising that land 
um, to provide a burial option that um, yeah, met the needs of, of the community that's becoming a bit more environmentally aware. Yep, so to be buried in here, you have to have, a, a, I guess, an environmentally um, sensitive coffin. So um, people can be buried in just a shroud, so just in a cloth. Um, or a simple pine box or a cardboard box. So we don't allow the standard coffins um, with all the, the metal fixtures that are laminated. So it has to be something that um, yeah, sort of fits with the environmental um, credentials of this, this facility. We've got yeah, over 100 people buried in the, in the Bushland Cemetery and also some reservations as well. Um, it's becoming increasingly popular and I believe um, particularly in our area around Lismore, the community is very environmentally aware um, of the, what their impact on the environment is. So um, it gives um, residents a, a choice when they, when they do die to, to be buried in a more eco-friendly option. Um, but at the same time, we actually are attracting um, people from outside Lismore. So we've had some people from Tamworth, even Brisbane come and reserve plots um, because they're aware of, of, I guess, the principles of the cemetery and, um, yeah, and, and really want to embrace that when they pass away. Is the cost for being buried in the uh, Bush Cemetery significantly different from the standard Lawn Cemetery? Um, it's actually a little bit cheaper to be buried in the Bushland Cemetery. Um, just probably, it's basically around, around the maintenance. So um, in the Bushland Cemetery here, we, uh, we do a lot of bush regeneration and we have um, regenerators come in and do weeds and we can we control the, the weeds and the pests. But that's about it. From a, from a maintenance perspective, if you look at a Lawn Cemetery where you have to mow the grass every week, um, prune the roses, fertilise the roses. Um, it's yeah a really really costly exercise. So um, from an economic perspective, it is is um, yeah better value to be buried in the bushland cemetery. I guess it's it's the, the people that are getting buried in here are the people that are environmentally re really have a, a conscience about the environment. So I guess they have a peace of mind when where loved one is is buried in the bushland cemetery that. Um, you know, it is obviously benefiting the environment. It's, it's a, a good way to to have someone remembered in a, in a nice bush setting. For those especially environmentally minded, there is a further option not yet available in Australia, but popular in the United States, known as conservation burial. Dr. Matthew Holden from the University of Queensland has researched the costs and effectiveness of conservation burial at saving endangered species. So it goes beyond just natural burial. Burial sort of exists sort of on a continuum of uh, sort of how green they are, right? So a green burial or a burial that avoids sort of unnatural components um, can be beneficial. But we're talking about burials that are specifically targeted to save threatened species. So for example, you would actually choose the land in a way that would protect um, a, a potential particular species or, a, or an ecosystem that was under threat rather than just putting in sort of a natural burial site maybe within a city. Well, a lot of people think about traditional, the impacts of traditional burial in terms of CO2 emissions and uh, toxic chemicals potentially leaking into the soil. But really, probably the biggest harm to the environment is just getting rid of land. Whenever you make a cemetery, you use up a lot of land. And habitat destruction is the number one cause of biodiversity decline. So the idea is to use the burial process to serve, conserve endangered species. So for example, instead of doing a traditional burial where you put a headstone and you use a lot of unnatural materials, you'd completely do a natural style burial, basically restoring the environment above the, the burial site. And you'd, you wouldn't have things like headstones, but you'd use the money that goes towards funding a funeral towards protecting that land and restoring that land to save nature. Well, I think it's about just creating a legacy for your loved ones. We've sort of, I think, gotten past the uh, materialistic age where we want, you know, fancy cars, big houses, big statues commemorating our loved ones. And we want to think about 
uh, creating a legacy for our loved ones in terms of doing something good for the world. It's really, it's really a no-brainer. You could walk in a field and uh, that's been restored due to uh, your loved one passing away and having a natural burial or a conservation burial that there, hear a bird chirp and actually think to yourself, oh, my loved one saved that threatened species from going extinct. I think the, the one thing that's really important is that um, conservation burials go beyond green burial. There's a lot of companies that are going to start sort of, you, the phrase is often used uh, um, amongst people in everyday life is called greenwashing. And the idea is that the company sells this environmental message, but really what they're doing doesn't actually benefit the environment all that much. It's more of a marketing play. There's the big potential for this in terms of green burials where they might, they might bury you naturally and then just charge a lot of money for it and try and upsell this sort of environmentally friendly aspect. Where instead we're saying what's important is that the extra money the, that you save from not getting a tombstone and a fa fancy casket and this increased this maintenance and perpetuity that needs to go towards restoration and buying land and making big swaths of land for nature to save threatened species. And um, it's important that we have mechanisms to um, make sure that people who are doing these conservation burials and advertising them aren't sort of swindle, swindling loved ones in their sort of their greatest time of need when they're mourning. It would be pretty sad if they were being um, told that, that their, their burial for their loved one was actually uh, environmentally friendly when it wasn't. In that same study mentioned earlier by McCrindle, over 30% of those asked said that they were worried, scared, or hated thinking about funerals. For some, a way to facilitate these conversations involves hiring a death doula. So I'm Nicole Lloyd, I'm an end-of-life doula. Um, I'm an end-of-life consultant, transition coach, who specialises in all end-of-life aspects. So, first question, what is a death doula? Um, quite simply, a death doula is non-medical support. And that covers a range of things from maybe uh, logistics, paperwork, support, working through that, all the way through to um, someone just to be there, to hold your hand, have a cup of tea with, someone who's got your back, to advocate for you. We don't offer medical assistance, we offer everything else but medical assistance. I think for a lot of people we support so many different areas, so um, people at the end of their life sometimes they know death is coming and there's a lot of questions, concerns, fears, beliefs that they want to address, sometimes having an external person, not a family member, um, and if they're not a particularly religious person, they don't maybe have a, a chaplain or, or a monk that they would go and turn to. A death doula is someone who they can talk to about that. They've also got someone who's got some of the practical know-how, you know, the questions that come up about, oh, do I want to be, you know, buried, cremated, what are my options? We're the sort of people who, who have that answers, all those research schools, all those networks. So I think for a lot of people it's just having that support that's not emotionally attached like a family member. And because our services range from knowing what some of the legalities are, knowing what the paperwork is that really helps you, knowing what the impact is if you don't have your affairs in order, what that, how that impacts your family and those left behind, and that we have an, an emotional support, palliative care has all of that and their focus is on pain relief, pain management, how we uh, help someone in their specific you know, needs regarding their, their health. Whereas a doula, we tend to, sometimes it's help a family, going into a family and, and seeing that what they need is somebody to do the housework for a week while they actually spend time with their loved ones. So it's a slightly different tilt. A lot, I speak to a lot of people and one of the fears that they have is when I'm gone, how will my family cope without me? And so I think it's a little bit um, peace of mind for them to know that there's somebody that I can turn to, like myself, who can refer them to a good grief counsellor or can ensure that, you know, 
they know what, what is next in the plan. What are some of the options and things that you think most people really don't know about end of life care that you really think would be important for a lot of people to know? Um, I'll take two steps back from that and about end of life planning because a lot of people don't realise how important it is to have a plan for your end of life regardless of your age or health condition. So even if you're healthy, you've got no reason to suspect that you're going to die anytime soon. If you don't have an end of life plan and you pop off the planet unexpectedly, there is a lot of paperwork, um, details, administration that need to be taken care of. You know, not just the funeral type arrangements of buried cremation, what to do with the body, but, but the, you know, who's got all my bank account details and passwords, who's, who's got access to all my um, paperwork for cars, houses, mortgages, blah, blah, blah. So my first thing is, you know, people being prepared for that takes away a lot of stress on family afterwards. When it comes to end of life, people who have been given a diagnosis or know that their time is running short, then I think for me it's about how do you finish your life with no regrets? What is it in your life that would make you feel complete? So when the time comes, it's, you know, you're not on the deathbed literally going, hang on a minute, I still want to. You know, I'm sure we have those moments, but that you can be in a place where you've made some peace with where you are and knowing that it's it's an it's an inevitable time so it's to help families realize that you know what's normal and what's not normal and the the considerations of lots of people think oh I want to die at home but they don't have a conversation with their family to say can you handle it if I die yeah. at home I'm going to die in the bed that we've shared for 30 years of marriage. Are you okay with that? Yeah. You know, there's a lot of conversations that people don't have because they just don't realise it's just a balance. It's just a, you know, a set of, I, I guess, to query all the options. And for lots of people, you know, they have families who go, yeah, actually, I'm okay with that. Yeah. And when you die, I'm going to replace the bed. And that's okay. It's yeah. just practical stuff. But so why don't you think many people really know about this side of, you know, the side of care or really think about some of those options? I think it's a it's a bit of a spider's web of it's a topic that not a lot of people talk about in the first place and because we don't top up, talk about it in everyday conversation people haven't really built their death conversation muscle so it's not a casual conversation and so it takes a little bit more thought and more planning and I think the reason that people don't look into it is there's a lot of fear and belief around it and people don't treat it like purchasing a new car you know if you just wanted to buy a new car, you would do research about, you know, costs and makes and models and recommendations. People don't think to do that before death. They don't think, let me consider my options, let me go and research the cost of a coffin so that I know what my family are in for. It's just not a topic that people, you know, embrace. A small percentage of people do. People love researching holiday options because it's fun and exciting. People don't think it's fun and exciting to research death options. It is a topic to start dipping your toe into because 100% of us are going to die and I think the more we can talk about it and think about it, the more fear we take out of it, the less traumatic it will be at the end. And secondly, your death is not just about you. It is about your family, it is about your community, it is about everyone around you and so how can you have conversations and do plans in such a way that everyone is left with a good experience you know so people get to remember you in a way you wish to be remembered as well as in a way that they can move through uh, with a little bit more ease and grace.